Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you didn't know, Product School teaches product management, coding, data analytics, digital marketing, and blockchain courses online and at our 15 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Today, we have an awesome guest presenting. I'd like to introduce you to Gain Schwaran. Currently, Gain Schwaran is a product management leader at Wordplay in Boston. He has previously worked as a senior product manager at Salesforce. He is an accomplished product executive with a track record of successfully launching multiple new products. He also has extensive experience in bringing products to market from their inception. Feel free to leave any questions for Gain Schwaran in the Facebook comments, and we'll be sure to address them at the end. Without further ado, let's welcome Gain Schwaran. Thank you so much for joining us today. Are you there, Gain Schwaran? Hmm. You're still muted and uh, your video is muted as well. I'm going to unmute your video or your audio right now, okay? Sure. Okay, I just unmuted your audio and let's see if I can get your video started here too. There we go. Hello. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having me. The product school is really a privilege. And hello, everyone. Uh, before I get into the presentation, let me make sure I wish I able to see my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. while we get our screen sharing going here, guys. Is it not working? Then can you? Uh, no, nope. we don't see your screen yet. Can you reconnect? I mean, I'll need to. Uh, Hmm, yeah, let me see. Let me try sharing my screen here again. And um, I'll try to bring it back to you and share this. And then I'll stop it. And then you should see down at the bottom a little share screen or at the top um, underneath the meeting ID. Yeah, I do not see that. Hmm. <clears throat> you remember how we did it before, yeah? It was different for your Mac, I think. Right. If you want, you can also send me your presentation and I can share my screen and then uh, click when you say next. Uh, let, me, let me send my send the presentation. Cool. Sorry guys, just a couple minutes while we get the presentation going here. <laughs>
Hi, Ben. I just, I've just shared. Yep. Cool. Let me check my email quick. There we go. Perfect. Opening slides. No, this will make it a little difficult for me, guys, for me to ask you guys uh, questions at the end. So uh, don't forget to post your questions and um, I will get to them. It'll just be a little different. <laughs> uh, let's make this present. Oops. Let me share my screen. Share. Share. And let's go present. Cool. Now, just give me a heads up when you want to go next slide. Absolutely. Thanks, Ben. No problem. I'll let you go now. All right. So hope uh, everyone is able to hear me okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ganesh Varan, part of product management at Volpe. Volpe is the biggest payment processor in the entire world. I belong to e-commerce product organization. Previously, I was at Salesforce, Nokia, and Mathworks, serving at similar capacities. Today, I'm going to share my thoughts on pricing data-centric products. Next. Then you can go to the next. So the topics of the day are just overview of data subject product and the product categories and proving the value proposition. Based on the context, we'll be stepping into pricing uh, methods. And by no means, this is an exhaustive pricing discussion, but uh, I just take the pricing methods relevant for data centric products that uh, I have seen and I have observed. So with that, let's go to the next slide. Then you can go to the next slide. Then you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Let's first set the context. Um, any product that takes a decision based on set of data Actually, uh, the previous slide, go to the previous slide. Is this the right slide? I, I've gone to the next one. <laughs> and I think the refresh is good. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me start with the overview. Any product that takes a decision based on set of data that system has already gathered or learned over a period of time. This is a wide net to cast. However, for today's discussion, we are narrowing down to products that does uh, whatever is being uh, listed out here. The product that sits behind the scene and taking decisions based on historic data available to the system, products and services that have the ability to learn in order to predict an event or suggest to take an action products that implies a wide variety of statistical measures and infer certain trend and transform a reasonably large data set at certain frequencies to gain insights. These are uh, data-centric products that usually will not have a tangible or perceptible outlook, so to speak. Right? They always must sit behind the scene and uh, that's a wonderful job. However, when those data products hit the market, how are we pricing them and what are the challenges is what we are going to look at. Then we can go to the next slide. Yeah, in this slide, uh, what I've done is uh, just a broad categories just to uh, build a sort of a framework in order for uh, pricing. So pricing is a really complex exercise but having this kind of a thought process you know, would help us to hone in on crucial details. So the broad categories uh, out outlined here are uh, products that improve efficiency, products that improve effectiveness, expert systems, and products that drive innovation. Next, next slide. 
Uh, use cases are just mentioned here. There are really exhaustive set of use cases, but just for our conversation, just so you know, make sure what we are talking about. Um, and I have just listed a few use cases so that you know we know what we are talking about, and also it's good to have these use cases in mind while we are talking about the KPIs and what are the metrics that uh, we are about to measure. The use cases such as uh, computing um, baseline based on historic data, learning models to understand the trend, your watchdog, your monitoring system, and you know, list cost routing. List cost routing is one of my uh, current products in my portfolio. So with those use cases, let's go to the, the next slide. Next slide is value proposition. What type of products we are you know, going to discuss? Let's spend some time on the value proposition, which are essential for pricing discussion. Uh, more often than not, um, senior management involves in pricing uh, decisions uh, without paying much attention to what value uh, these products bring to the market uh, uh, and also and also to the business. So without spending or without creating uh, a pricing a pricing scheme based on the value proposition, uh, it will be a difficult task if we start. Uh, without a price, without understanding the value proposition, and hence let's spend a few minutes on the value proposition. Uh, then we can go to the next slide. So here, really, what we are talking about is proving the value proposition. It's just a, sometimes a value proposition may be a one or two line or set of bullet points, but that's not the uh, case here. We are really talking about the data centric products that. We have to prove the value proposition that exists a real value and make sure we track the value and we measure it. For example, first and foremost is the market perception of the value. Let us say if we bring an intelligent engine uh, to the market, does the market ready to perceive the intelligence uh, the concept of the engine, whether the market is ready to, or otherwise, we may have to educate the market about the value itself. So that is the point number one. And the, similar to that particular attribute, there are other things such as commercial value for the business. Uh, a value proposition may or may not result in good, um, uh, a big commercial value. For example, a uh, recommendation engine, uh, in and of itself, may prove to be have some value, but in how much of a commercial value can be measured? Measuring is the next aspect. Can we measure and attract the KPIs? And does it attract and retain customers? And can we monetize? And end of the day, what is in it for customers? Right, I mean, these are the uh, six different perspectives. If you look at it, your yeah, value proposition is really uh, what going and can we can we uh, make a business of that uh, value proposition and even so whether the value proposition is really trackable and measurable so that we can quantify accurately and be able to monetize right so that is the value proving the value proposition aspect of uh, uh, pricing but with that, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is a uh, very you know, light uh, weight information. The KPIs for pricing. If you sift through all the you know, data points uh, on the value proposition, only a few would even you know, demand for pricing. The others could be, yes, there is a value, but you no know, can be. Can we price a product based on that value question? So we have to first identify the value elements. We have to first list the value proposition. And, uh, and in that, if you sort it through, we have to identify the value elements for both parties, for both customers and the business. And we should measure 
and make sure we have uh, enough you know, ROI uh, uh, can be obtained of those KPIs. So, let me go to the next slide. So with that in mind, having said that context, let's slowly step into pricing. Uh, by no means this presentation is about uh, exhaustive pricing in models. It's not a discussion about extensive pricing techniques. However, it gives sort of a very high level framework so that product managers do not miss the necessary uh, attributes to be considered for pricing. Uh, next slide. In this slide, you know, what I have done is just, you know, broad buckets to identify as a framework. So the broad buckets are, so this is, you know, nothing but uh, the discategorization we have seen just now in one of the previous slides. Product centered around efficiency is one big bucket. Where efficiency could be a cost saving, high performance, etc. And expert products, the economic value is based on the judgment, uh, judgment of recommendations. And products centered around effectiveness. Here, the key thing is how to measure the, the efficient workflow. But uh, we should be able to measure, measure that. Uh, that being the, the KPI of here, that in and of itself is challenging. The next category is the innovation. How our product will drive the innovation. So with that in mind, and as you can see in subsequent slides, every category would bring challenges in terms of identifying the key value elements. Let's go to the next slide. See the efficient systems. The e Sorry, screen is about to refresh. Sorry. Uh, what are they? The routine activities are optimized with well defined rules. There are no if, if then rules, configurations, and processes to achieve a low cost performance, right? Now that's kind of a very high level de definition for these efficient systems. And the value proposition could be, you know, how fast, what is the you know, speed with which you, know, you can, you know, realize certain things. And does it reduce waste? These are all the examples of you know, value proposition. And the KPIs being the measurable economic and strategic value of uh, you know, efficiency, being time and cost components. Those are the key things to go after. Uh, before price, so those key things that would translate into how much how much value it's going to bring in terms of uh, in, uh, in terms of cost, and accordingly we can factor that into pricing. So, for example, uh, if an efficient system uh, demonstrates reducing the waste, let's say fifty thousand uh, uh, dollars for twelve month period of time. But if we price it about in hundred thousand dollars for a product, you know, uh, as an annual fee, it won't cut it. So we have to make sure it demonstrates the right value proposition and accordingly translates the value. The next is the expert systems. What are they? Expert systems are designed to solve complex problems by reasoning through bodies of knowledge. The decision making ability of human experts. So it actually you know, augments uh, an expert. In this case, uh, an expert could be a surgeon or a mining um, personnel or you know, it could be you know, anyone who is already expert in his job. And this expert systems would augment, support his you know, decision making ability. So such systems. What are the KPIs look like? So the knowledge base itself is a value there, and the impact and suggestions that the system could, could, could provide so that 
uh, a human who is already expert in that field now takes advantage of such a recommendation uh, by by this by, by the system uh, by the underlying system. So the KPIs are again economic and strategic value of suggestions made by made by recommendation and inference engine. As you can see, you know how to how to measure that, how to measure an economic value of a recommendation is is, uh, is an exercise in and of itself. Let's move on to the next slide. The effectiveness of the system. Some data centric products are centered around providing an effectiveness. It improves overall ability to a group or you know, set of machines to produce certain you not know, desired result. It enhances uh, coordination, communication, and collaboration. So in that case, one has to measure this value proposition and translate and translate the economic value and derive the economic value out of out of its the underlying value proposition. Because these these products it orchestrates the complex workflow. When it orchestrates a complex workflow, so having this product, how the workflow is going to look like and what the result is going to look like. And having this product, how the workflow improves. So here in this case, we are kind of talking about an AB, AB testing so that we can uh, clearly measure having a system and not having a system, what the effect, and that effect we have to measure it and translate that to economic or strategic value. Next is the system that drives innovation. This is another level of complexity. Here in this case, um, it again helps humans to really uh, go to extreme conditions, for example, simulating uh, volcanic eruption so that, uh, yet, so that that simulation can be used to test certain things, to verify certain inferences. Um, you know, these systems would help um, really uh, creative folks like scientists, and designers, architects, so on and so forth. Uh, these are crucial, very uh, crucial systems. However, the KPS, if you see, being able to emulate uh, extreme conditions and the new design suggestions uh, are general uh, results of these these systems. But how to measure? How to measure their? how to measure the you know, value proposition is for, for our pricing is the key thing out here. Uh, with that, let's go to the next slide. So this next slide is a very basic slide. Uh, the reason I have brought this slide into our conversation is more often than not, when it comes to pricing, the basic things are just uh, not even considered or discussed. So if you see here, what I have just illustrated here is uh, all the data centric products I have just you know, alluded to takes a lot of time to uh, hit the market. We have to first um, uh, build a data center, build a, you know, a data mart, and the mining uh, could have happened, and the learning could have happened, uh, in order to in order to realize certain you know results, all would have consumed a lot of money. So the total cost, the total cost of uh, development, fixed cost and variable cost, everything should be included so that when we hit the market and when we price the product, we get we get the uh, bang for the buck. So that's basically what uh, this slide is for. This slide is to just to remind ourselves that, hey, we have spent a lot of money in order to reach thus far, and let's consider this. 
And there's nothing new. Every product manager would know this cost, this underlying cost, but I just you know, put that uh, in place so that we don't miss it. It often uh, gets more look. This is helpful for the uh, break-even. So once we have the break-even, once we have uh, found the break-even uh, number, and let's go to the next uh, slide. So here, um, we are starting out with the premium pricing model. Generally, because of the intelligence involved in data-centric products, uh, organizations tend to uh, go with the premium pricing model. But for premium pricing model, we have to make sure the break-even uh, pricing has been calculated somehow, like in the previous slide, and apply the premium cushion. Here, the point is, the unique value proposition in the market is the key, and another key aspect is the high quality. If, uh, if an organization is, is going after a premium pricing model, we have to make sure the product is of high quality, and it has a really unique value proposition where there, is, there are no competition, at least at the moment, when the product hits the market. And that's what will, would give us the premium cushion. And the premium cushion, whatever that may be, accordingly, uh, you, can, uh, you can price it. That's going to be the market price. So that's the premium pricing model. With that, let's go to the next one. The penetration. The penetration pricing model, we all know, uh, this is done to increase the you know, adoption. Here, the, the pre-work is necessary, meaning, you know, what is the cushion that the market actually you know, withstands? That cushion, that price cushion is what will be layered on top of the uh, break-even price. So if we put them together, then that's going to be the market price. Here, unlike uh, premium you know, cushion, this price cushion in the penetration model is, you know, we need to do the market analysis to understand how much of a price cushion uh, the market can withstand for a product that we are trying to bring it to the market. So with the breaking price and identify, this is at this point, it's all of estimated values. With that estimated value, we can build a price cushion on top of it to hit the market. Um, this is based on market affordability. So at this juncture, you know, I would like to introduce uh, uh, one pricing model, which is a freemium pricing model. So generally, freemium is, I have not uh, uh, introduced a slide for premium model, but we all know. Um, the commodity price will be either free or a uh, very basic price. And with that, you now there's a high premium to be paid for the value for whatever value the premium uh, product that comes with it. So the premium is just a blend of a, a premium and the penetration model. And that's all that's all to do. And next is the bundle pricing model. And again, uh, the bundle pricing is done um, let's say usually the yeah, data centric product comes with a lot of other peripheral things such as the reporting, cool, uh, user interface, so on and so forth, and that that brings a big package. Uh, so generally, the pricing would be based on the entire package. However, the, the key to the package is this data centric product. And the entire package are all the components of a package are built around this data center, center product. So you sell as a package. In this way, uh, other peripherals do not need uh, separate marketing and uh, other efforts. So you can sell it as a package. Uh, the key, the heart of the product is, is the data center product that drives everything. And here again, uh, the the base price, which is the breaking price on the picture, and then whatever we built on top of the discounted total component price and the package, package cushion is what uh, actually determines the final market price. Another, another pricing model 
is a revenue share model. It's an interesting model. One of my products actually go by this philosophy. Um, we have a we we talk about the KPIs and the value elements for a product. Once we clearly have identified how we are proving the value and how we are measuring the value, and that value is, can be translated to dollar amount. So that dollar amount is for consumers or our customers of the product to take. But that value could be shared as well. And once we prove that value to our customers, and what we can do is we can ask for, for a split. Hey, this is the value that you are getting. Here you go. We have reports and you know others to prove the value. Once the value is proven and customer realizes that value, so having split that value is the revenue share. So what is the revenue, the total revenue realized? And here, um, we as a service provider and the customer who is the beneficiary of the service can split the value. That split could be 50-50. More often than not, that's not the case. And for whatever percentage we agree to, we share the value. So this is that's the revenue share model. Um, let's move on to the next. Next is a pair event uh, value model. Uh, usually you will see this trend in you know, fraud alerts and things of uh, that nature. Uh, for every event that got triggered, and that is the key, uh, key value proposition of the product, right? For example, every fraud alert. For every fraud alert, uh, we can charge. And that's the pair event model. And otherwise, the product actually really be you know, kicking in the uh, background, but it doesn't generate money. And it will generate money. The, the revenue is proportional to the events generated. So that's how uh, the product, that, that's how we can monetize uh, such products. So that's the pair event model. So those are the um, high level pricing models that can be uh, really you know, useful for data centric products. There are other models that I explored that may or may not uh, work out very well, but again, you know, this is not a, a exhaustive pricing uh, exercise as I mentioned, and these are the successful models that are you know, available just to, uh, to keep in mind. With that, I'm going to end this presentation and uh, I'm here to field any questions that this class may have. Hi, right. hey, thank you so much for that presentation, Dan Chuaran. It was great. Um, so, one question I always like to ask our speakers before we go is, um, do you have any advice for aspiring product managers? If there was one thing you could tell someone who wants to become a product manager, what would it be? Yeah, one um, uh, suggestion is consider yourself a problem solver and try to try to uh, solve a problem for for the market. And that's going to be my my, my suggestion. Manager. Great. Thank you so much. So before we go, uh, I just wanted to give you guys all some more information about our uh, upcoming courses and events. So you have the resources to become a product manager. Um, we offer part-time courses for anyone ready to take their career to the next level. Our product management, coding, digital, digital marketing, data analytics, and blockchain courses are taught by industry experts working at companies like Google and Facebook. In addition to that, we offer weekly online events like this one and on-site events at our 15 campuses across the U.S. and U.K. and Canada. And if you're located near a campus, head over to productschool.com and you can do a product, uh, you can do a campus tour. And you can also find us on social media at Product School and be sure to keep up with uh, the latest product management content at the product blog at productschool.com. Thank you all for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day and I hope to see you next week. Thank you so much. Have a great day, Ginshwaran. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me.